I'm just going to paint a big picture, uh, tell you a little bit about my story uh, of, and I, I'm trying to avoid using cliche words like pivoting and uh, that we've all heard to death by now. Uh, but in all fairness, for us, it was a zero, as a 360 to zero overnight uh, for us, same as many, many of you. And uh, so we did, same as everybody else, sit on the couch and did some navel glazing and watch, uh, binge watch as many shows as we could. And that was great for the first week. And then uh, boredom set in and we said, well, we can't do this. That's not my personality. It's not who I am. I like to be busy. And we started this little show for the fun of it for our friends. And we just basically send uh, a little post on our Facebook to our friends and said, friends and family and said, Hey, want to learn how to cook? I'm bored. So every day we're going to cook something new and join us for the fun of it. And uh, so when we first started that, <clears throat> we had a fan base of, you know, give or take 15 to, 15 to 19,000 people uh, that followed us. And uh, as we grew this show, uh, our fan base grew. And our full intention, honestly, was let's just do this for a couple of weeks and see where it goes. Well, I'm happy to say, or I'm not sure if I'm happy to say, but I guess I am happy to say we are tomorrow. Uh, today will mark our 480 show since we started. And that's two years ago. March 20th is the 2020 is when we started this. And uh, I have to say, it's, it's, uh, it's been quite a journey. So uh, our total numbers right now, followers, are 53,411. And all of it has been done through word of mouth, through, of course, the way social media works. But we're doing something that took the people's mind away from this famous COVID aspect. And that's why it was it's been successful for us. Uh, we want to make sure today what we touch on is not only all the success of this, but also the headaches, the heartaches, and how we got to get to this point. It didn't open, it, did, it sounds like it's overnight, all of a sudden we have this success. But it's basically something that we've been nurturing for years without even realizing it. So for me, when I did events all over the world, all over the place, Often I would just sit in my room at the end of the event and do a post of what I did and uh, engage people and so on and so forth. So many sleepless nights, you know, uh, finish your event at midnight, you're two, three o'clock in the morning, you're still working on social media, whatever. So it's a commitment. And for those of you who are looking for that instant gratification of the success of working virtually or working online, it requires a little bit of hard work. So just may want to put that in, in perspective. So, but you could nowadays turn any business into a successful business via the internet. And what was never on our radar as a marketing plan is now leading our entire company. So we probably have had our most successful year we've ever had as the Kilted Chef this past year, and we haven't been anywhere. So it's all been done through our kitchen. Now, spin off from there, all kinds of great stuff, of course. But let me tell you the start from the humble beginning of where it started. So we started doing these live shows, didn't know anything about it, honestly. So we uh, went in the basement, got, our, got the ladder, got some duct tape, and uh, we set up the ladder and the duct tape, because we didn't know how to prop the camera. We didn't have a camera. We did everything on our phone. Uh, and that's how it started. So for the first week, <laughs> there's not a show that the camera didn't fall flat first, boom, right in the middle of the show, because you're live, right? It just happens all the time. So we had to, week two was, okay, how do we improve that? So we figured out, Jimmy rigged it with some plywood, figured out, how it wouldn't fall out and so on. And that's how we continued. Uh, but it evolved from there. So, but what made the show as successful as it still is today is the fact that it was authentic, it was real, and it was a glimpse into our personal lives. And people love 
that being able to, to sort of be the inside. Where I'm standing right now is our everyday home kitchen. This is, this is the background. This is where the stove is, our knives, our spices, or whatever. If I turn it around, you'll see the live show section, which is on my right, and so on. But honestly, we've just decided, we decided to continue this on for the fun of it. We thought, okay, it'll last till the pandemic is, is over. Well, guess what? It's not over <laughs> and neither is the pandemic. So we might as well adjust and make this work. So we've then went, we were running this show seven days a week. And we said, well, seven days a week seem it's a lot of commitment. You know, after a couple, after five months, we're going like, wow, I'd like to eat something. I'd like to repeat something that I haven't eaten in five months. You know what I mean? Like it, it's like, this is real. And the whole time we're doing this show, we talk to our public or our consumers or people that are following us exactly how I'm talking to you guys, right from the hip, you know, just straightforward, honest as possible. And as authentic as we can make the show, the better it is. All of a sudden the internet, gone. We're, we're living in the country. We're rural Nova Scotia. We're by the water. All kinds of crap happens. So it never fails. You know, when you've got the show plan, you got all these things done, all of a sudden you got no internet left. What do you do? So you go lock, you you lose, you lose out, and then you try to re-sign in with another device and so on and so forth. So that's what really kept people alive. So for us on average, just turning the clock down a whole two years later, uh, just about. Uh, we have, this is what the show has produced. We're just about ready to launch our seventh ebook. So every single recipe that we've done since the beginning has been recorded and it's been documented into an ebook. We first launched our ebook and we sold a fair amount of it, but it wasn't as successful as we thought. So what we did is we went out and got some sponsors and got sponsors to help us with the eBooks. And now if you go on our website under shop or chef, www.kiltedchef.ca, there is book number two, three, four, five, and six are there at no charge. So anybody can upload the recipes that we've done. Like that's how transparent we've made this little business. Okay, so how we monetized it, because we got to live too, is by selling ads into those books. So when you're reading the recipes, you may have a food related business that's trying to show you that, hey, by the way, we exist, this is what we do, sort of thing. So it's worked. So then from there, spinned off some new endorsement products. We always wanted to do our own line of certain products that we felt are very important to us. Uh, and then we started launching it. And we created this character called the Kilted Chef, but uh, more in a cartoonish way. So here he is in the first product that we launched and it's called Hot Under the Kilt. And he's, we can't be afraid to make fun of ourselves. So there he is with the Acadian flag proud and his name is the Kilted Chef. He hasn't changed his name, but he just looks kind of funny. He looks a little ragged, uh, but we said, well, this has been so successful. Let's run him into other products. So we engage this art, we, we have uh, one of my uh, chefs that I've been mentoring for years is the chef at the Botanical Garden in Edmonston, New Brunswick by the name of Paula Lance. And Paula, I call her my artisanal chef because she's an artist, she's not, she's not a chef, but she's learned through all pains and uh, uh, working with me for years and so on. And now she's doing such a great job, but she's also an artist and designer. So she developed the Kilted Chef guy. Then we said, well, let's incorporate them in the next product. And the next product was called the Badass Burger Booster. And the Badass Burger Booster is this one. And there he is, the same character. He's now an El Salvador uh, cowboy. And he's got a branding iron for that piece of meat that's going to go into that spice. And we've played on to this. And then we, we launched a... Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Uh, we launched then the mustard a little bit of play on Marilyn Monroe, a delicatessen. There's the chef with his kilt sitting there. Uh, it's called Some Like It Hot, like the movie, of course. Just launched a few salad dressing. Uh, one is called Let It Be. 
And it's John Lennon on Abbey Road. There he is as a different character. There's one called Laddie Sings the Blues, which is a maple. Uh, this is the maple and wild blueberry vinaigrette. This was the citrus honey. So I'm just, what I'm trying to say is from this little show, taped on the side of a ladder is coming all this stuff, okay? And just recently, just arrived today, nobody's seen this before, you're the first one to see it. There's a little maple company in New Brunswick that decided, say, to team up with us. And now we have a hot under the kilt infused maple syrup. So it's all about where it's at. So then we said, well, how do we, how do we make a living out of this, right? Because, okay, the e-commerce stuff, that's a little bit of a, a living. And the way it started as well was our launching our first spatula. Darlene, you remember this from when we do shows at, at GMIS, of course, we have our own spatula. But now we said, well, let's develop our own tool. We have a new tool called the spoonchula. A spoonchula is a measuring spoon and a spreader, both of which are made out of New Brunswick white birch. And an artist out of Bakerbrook, New Brunswick is doing those. And we said, well, okay, how can we involve Newfoundland? Because we love working with Newfoundland. So of course, we went to Deer Lake to our friends, James, and uh, now we have our charcuterie boards, right? That are made out of deer, from Deer Lake, made out of um, larchwood. So, and then the scrapers, and then larchwood from uh, Cape Breton developed a cutting board just for us. And like, it's just spinning off out of, out of control a little bit, but fun. And we said, well, how can we do something that our, our consumers were saying, you know, I, I know I could go on the website and I could buy these things and I could do whatever, but how can I get my hands on these so it's fun? So we thought, we brainstormed and we said, let's do a surprise curated box. And this was the start of a success story on its own. So we decided to do a Kilted Chef curated box. People have no clue what's in the box. We don't tell them what's in the box. It's a surprise. It's 75 bucks a box. And we've limited it to 100 box at the beginning. Okay, so you could buy 100 box, first come, first serve. They sold it 15 minutes, the first round. So we said, well, we might as well increase it to 150. It's the second round. And we only do six a year. So that's how we created, that's how we started creating another level of the business because we don't want to rely everything on Facebook because they control it. So we started going on our newsletter side, which is a, a big, big, very important key to the marketing plan moving forward. So right now we have 7,500 people on our mailing list or in our newsletter. We do a weekly newsletter and that's where we talk to the public and sell things and so on and so forth. It's been a great journey and it works really, really well. And that's how we've been able to sell these curated boxes. So then we thought the success of the show itself, it was continuing to grow. So now from this, this little show that we were doing just for the fun of it, we have on average two to four sponsors a week. We only do four shows, so just to give you an idea. So, okay, so now instead of being a consultant at a restaurant that you work really hard and people are, we had to replace our revenue somehow. So this is becoming the replacement of revenue. Are we doing something different at the recipe? No, we're just engaging that company using one of their products in the recipe so it works but we're still doing the recipes that we want to do. We're not just throwing a bunch of stuff. It's kind of funny because we're also, as part of this, incorporating the culture of where I'm from. I'm an, a proud French Acadian from the Edmonston region of New Brunswick, moved from Edmonston. I was only 17 years old and never looked back. Been very lucky, an extraordinary career. I've been in all corners of the world cooking with some of the most amazing people, with some of the most amazing product from Atlantic Canada. Very, very proud of that. But the show itself needed to incorporate some of that. So like this past week, we did a show on boudin. Boudin is a blood pudding. A lot of people don't know what a blood pudding is. And we had thousands and thousands of people saying, 
what? You're doing what? My grandpa used to eat that blank, blank, blank stuff. And what's, what's this about? And what does it taste like? And all of a sudden, this little company in New Brunswick, in Petit Rocher, is getting calls constantly, looking people looking for this boudin. So from all around the world, because people following our show is not just Atlantic Canada, it's all across Canada, and it's all across the US and some in Europe as well. That's 25% of our audience is abroad. The 75% of our audience is in Atlantic Canada. So you're, you're marketing to everybody around you as much as possible, right? So for those of you who don't know what blood pudding is, it's a sausage, coil sausage, that is full of a little bit of fat, some porridge, some uh, pork blood and a little bit of pork and that's about it some seasoning and it's in a casing it's congealed and you sear it in butter and you eat it with a boiled potato and some hot dog mustard that's the way you eat it or your your boudin itself dips in ketchup as well I mean, it's, it's plain food right so it doesn't appeal to everybody but it appeals to, the, to a fair amount of people so still today as we speak, almost two years later, we're still averaging per show between the post of the show of the recipe and the live show itself, close to 30,000 viewers or eyeballs to the show still today. And in the peak of the pandemic, we were in that 48, 45,000. So it hasn't let go. It, it's still very popular. And it's been great for companies to launch their products, been great for companies to talk about their products in general, and so on. So we said, well, this is gonna end sooner or later. It's like the success of anything, it always has a cycle and so on. So we try our best to try to stay alive and having fun with this. But sometimes it happens naturally. So I wanna tell you a few anecdotes that's taken place that's taken the show to the next level, okay? Sometimes you get this recipe that you do and it goes viral. You just don't know. I mean, we've had shows that have had 175 to 200,000 viewers. Very lucky. We've also had shows that piece things that people don't like that have tanked, that have done 50, well, tank by our standards, 15,000 or so. And we're going like, ooh, maybe we should do that again or whatever. But you just never know. So now, that the pandemic, you're no longer sitting home to waiting. People are busy lives and whatever. So they've incorporated this show as something they watch in a replay when they get home. Something they watch when they're on their break at work. Sometimes they watch it uh, when they're on their lunch break. Sometimes they binge walk on the weekend. We binge watch everything else. So it's nothing, we have a, a big percentage of our viewers that will sit there on Saturday morning with their coffee and we'll watch the four shows from the week, only to be engaged because what happens is we've created a culinary community in a way. It's averaging between 400 to 1600 comments per show, based on not only live, but what is people watching in replay. So then we incorporated some new ideas on how do we keep our audience so we start giving prizes away regularly once in a while and we've done all kinds of those funky foolish things but the one that have been the most beneficial is when mishaps happen so let me tell you about a, a sunny day in uh, in the first time we did a live show outside on our deck and it was our first barbecue show people were asking hey, what about something on the grill what about something on the grill so we said, yeah, let's do it. So we set up live. We got all ready. We had, we had a barbecue that we've had for years, probably seven or eight years. So first time using the barbecue of the season. I wasn't one of those year-round barbecues regularly. Now, since the show, we now have our own shack and we barbecue year-round, you know, because we are doing stuff there. But here's what happened during the show. We had... Uh, watching live that day because it was a hot show. People were really interested in this. I remember it was a Thursday. Uh, by the way, the show's at three o'clock every day, but it was Thursday. Turn the barbecue on. Barbecue's at about 700 degrees. I got my prep table already. All the food is out. Everybody's excited. 
Joanne, who is always there with me, that's my wife, and she's always talking. She's got the comments. She reads the comments, asks me the questions. We answer the people questions live. That's the concept of the show. Well, guess what? We're ready to barbecue. Al, we're live, of course. 400 people watching live all over the place. You take the cover and lift it up. And I turn around and I start doing some stuff on the table, start chopping. The minute I chopped the first time, my cover went like this and leaned on my, my, uh, the railing of my deck. I'm going, oh, that's kind of strange. It's all right. So I decided to take the scrub, the, the, the actual <laughs> scraper from, uh, from Juniper Scraper. And I started scraping my barbecue. Then all of a sudden the whole top cover Bam! Fell right on the floor in the middle of the live show. So here's Al scrambling. It's 700 degrees. You don't want the cover to burn your deck. And I'm going to Joanne. I said, okay, you entertain for a bit. I'm going to pick this up. So I decide to wrestle the cover of the deck with my two hands and lift it up, try to put it back on. And it doesn't work. So I had to throw it on the lawn out off the deck so that it would fall off. So it was the most comical show of course because everybody was laughing at me uh yeah yeah you talk about a great game and it showed your vulnerability and i think that's what made a big, the big difference but here's what happened the next day our marketing team calls me and says uh we have a company that wants to sponsor you and i'm saying well what do you mean uh they saw your episode on the barbecue they're from ontario and uh, they have a store in Atlantic Canada and they want, they want to be part of this. Since then, we now have a beautiful outdoor kitchen fully equipped related to barbecue and grilling and smoking and so on and so forth. So to go to say to show your vulnerability when you're doing something like this is very important. Here's the guy that goes around the world promoting our lobster in the most prestigious places working with the top chefs, all of a sudden, it's a little vulnerable. His barbecue's on the prints. You know what I mean? So it's showing that side. Then later on this last winter, we were doing a casserole on the stove and the casserole I thought was granite and I'm stirring on a heat and so on. And all of a sudden, it explodes. There's onions everywhere. <laughs> There's uh, apples everywhere. It just broke right in the middle of the show. Never skipped a beat, just stepped on going and stirred and then made the dish. But it's those types of things that have made us as successful as we have been with this show. All right, so enough about the show. Let's talk about how to get there and let's talk about some of the not so glamorous things about the show. And those are the things that if you're thinking of doing a component of your business that involves huge public like this and the ability to be hiding behind a computer makes people want to say whatever they feel. And that is the tough part of the show that we don't talk about a lot, but it's something that as you, like, as you grow your business and you may wanna do some of this virtual stuff, be careful and you need to know going in that you need to have a tough skin for a few things. One, number one is the trolls. You got to have a program ready so that you can dump the trolls out as fast as possible. So that's the people coming on to your live show or coming on afterwards and flirting with all the people that are there trying to sell them something. Okay. So you need to make sure that you know how to do that. So that's number one. Number two is you have to stay consistent. Think of the commitment that we've done in the last two years. 480 days we've been in this kitchen or we've been outside in other people's kitchen or in other places because we, the show moves no matter where we go, the show goes because you could be live anywhere. You could do anything. So consistency is extremely important. Uh, understanding that you're building something. It's not gonna happen overnight. Just take that viral one video success thing out of your head because it's not 
it ha if it happens to you, congratulations, I'm very happy for you. But reality is you can make a whole business model around this without having that big hit, okay? What you've got to be is stay true to your brand, stay consistent, continue to do the hard work, but the commitment is the number one thing when it comes to this. It's one thing to just say, okay, I'm going to do this moving forward, but committing to this and sticking to it is going to be the success of this if you that's what you if that's where you want to go, okay? So to sh th those are the, the cons or the, the things that are difficult. You know, you, you've got to make sure that you own this and you got to make sure that you really, really, if you say black, it's got to stay black. And if you're evolving to white, you need to show them the way on how you're going to get there. Does, does that make sense? I, I, I just, I don't want to ramble on. I want to get to Q&A. So I've only got a few other things to mention and we'll jump to Q&A. And, and but the next subject I'd like to talk about is how to take this now and transition to the new life moving forward. Now, how, so for me, as my business grows, I've made a conscious decision now to say, okay, now because we have this commitment, we have all these people that are relying on us. The number one thing that, co that comes to a life when people are commenting to us or sending us private messages. Thank you for creating something for me to make me get through the pandemic. And that, if that doesn't tug at your heartstring, then nothing will. You know, when you're getting an email from a complete stranger and says, you know what? I'm single, I'm by myself, I'm living out of where my family and friends are. I don't have, I'm abroad. Or I'm in, uh, I'm as simply, I'm in San Andrews and all my family's in Moncton. I'm, you know, all those types of things. And people saying, you know what? I had nobody. All I had to look forward to besides being glued to the TV is knowing that at three o'clock, you're not going to talk COVID and we're going to be entertaining. We're going to have some fun. So if I touched a few people by doing that, then we succeeded. Simple as that. You know, that is, that's what we, that's what we hang our hats on in a way, right? That's how successful it's been. So then we thought, well, how do we move forward? How do we keep this audience or monetize this audience somehow? Because at one point or another, you need to make this your business as well, right? So we already know that if we're going to do a show promoting Atlantic Canada product like you were doing in the past in Montreal, you need to figure out a way to have a live show at three o'clock in Montreal, somewhere, somehow, of some sort to continue this train going, right? Because it's important. So you've got that to challenge with. But as well, you need to figure out a way to take this to the next level. So we did a curated box at Christmas that obviously we've been planning on this for a bit. But at Christmas, we're gonna, we, we've been planning, we started promoting it in October saying, we're going to do something super special at Christmas that you're going to want to send to your kids that are everywhere. You're going to want to do something. You want to want this box because if you don't, this box is going to be $100 and it's going to be worth 250 bucks. And everybody was like really into this and they just caught on to it. We sold 500, that was the max. We sold 500 curated box in November for December 1st shipping, just like that. So we said, okay, well, how do we capitalize on that? And we had in our back of our head, how do we take this show to the next level? So we created what we called the Kilted Chef Brigade. So the bri a brigade is a French terminology, la brigade, which, rep which means the, kil the, the kitchen team, like the chef is the head of the brigade. And then you have a sous chef, you have cooks, you have dishwashers, the list goes on. They are the brigade. So we created a Kilted Chef Brigade, private club. You have to pay a membership in order to be part of this brigade. And we said, okay, well, what does the brigade, why should I pay him to do? What is he gonna give me that he's not already giving me? So here's what we developed. 
So each month they get a skills class. So they learn how to make, do something that we've never taught them before. Example, the first skill class in February was knife skills. How to use a knife. So it was an hour, an hour long session like this where we taught them how to use a knife. We let them use the knives that they have in their hands and so on and so forth. That was a huge hit. Then we said in the middle of the month, we're gonna do what we call the brigade's office hour. In other words, the chef is in the office and you're gonna ask him whatever you want. So it's a live show, and it, but it's exclusive to those brigade members. Nobody else is allowed to be in there, okay? So that was a huge success. And we promised them that every single show, every month, we would do a supper club. So you know how we have supper clubs that we, we do on through the winter where we invite five friends and then we go to that next friend's house for the next meal and everybody brings something different. And then we go to the other guy's house and so on and so forth. So it's a bit like that concept, but we did a supper club and Saturday night was our first supper, supper club and it was a huge success. So how do we do this and make it interesting? So we launched this by, in each of those 500 boxes, we put a special VIP cooking class free for all of them that bought the box. So that was the big surprise in the box. So when they got that, they got free Zoom cooking class, which we typically would sell for 100, 150 bucks for a group that comes together with us and cooks for a couple hours. So that was a great, great way to do it. And you remember, we told them, we, we really work with them by saying you need to ship your son or your daughters abroad or wherever they're at to be part of this. Well, they got the VIP free pass. So they were cooking with their mom and dad who were wherever. So <clears throat> whether they were in Dieppe, New Brunswick and their kids is, are in, in Calgary, they were all on the same Zoom call cooking with us and the live show. So that is when we did the launch of the Brigade, because what a great opportunity. We had 600 people. We had 100, sorry, 286 people sign up for the VIP cooking class. And we averaged approximately two to three people per household that were actually doing the cooking class. So we had over six to 700 people live, captive audience to sell this Brigade. So they were exclusive offer for them to join the brigade. And the brigade was founding members rate at $14.95 a month or $149 a year. That was their choice to do what they want. And then we gave them a week to join. From there, we launched the same thing to our newsletter and we gave them a week. Then we announced it on the show for a week and then we closed it. Whatever memberships that we had at that point, it's closed now and there's nobody can join the brigade till we'll do a new launch again in May. So we got 270 members as of today, just like that. So we now have 270 members that are engaged part of this and who are doing these cooking classes and are talking to their friends about how cool this is and so on. So what we're pivoting to is to eventually have the brigade to five to a thousand members max and that becomes a business model of its own. So just trying to show you guys examples of how you could take a bad opportunities and turn it into a very fruitful opportunity. And when you think of it, we get a Netflix subscription for $15 a month and we don't even blink an eye and we might watch it once a month or we watch it every day. It depends, but some people don't. So then we created this private members page for the brigade. So now people, guess what they're doing in that brigade? They know it's only, only them. So they will post, hey, look, this is what I did for dinner last night, but I, this didn't work. I don't know what I did wrong. And all of a sudden, 60 people are chiming in going, you know, I did that before and this is how you fix it and this, brother. We've created this really cool new community 
So now you'll notice that our show is now four days a week and soon to be three days a week so that our Fridays and Mondays are dedicated to our weekends so we could do events everywhere else. So it's all about adapting to where you need to be. So we created this free show, which we managed to turn into a sponsored show, which we've managed to turn into a new viable business model for us to work. I think I covered everything. Uh, and uh, I, I hope you guys, I didn't bore anybody, but I want to leave before we go to Q&A to this. All of this was done without spending a single marketing dollar on trying to get fans. You know how you spend a lot of money on Facebook trying to build your fan base and so on? We did not. We did not spend money to build our Instagram fan. We are not focusing on Twitter because it doesn't seem to work to where we're going because it's more business related. So we've been focusing on Facebook as our main. There's over 19 million Facebook users every day. Not a bad platform to try to work on. Our demographic is 40 years old to 80 years old, um, more predominantly between that 40 and 65. Engaging as many men as there is women, yes, believe it or not. And the good part is we have an awful lot of, uh, my wife watches, I get this all the time at the grocery store and people don't look at me in the eye, you know, ladies, sorry, I know what you're feeling. They don't look at me in the eyes. They look at my cart to see what's in my cart. What am I shopping? What am I buying? You know, so on and so forth. But the husbands are coming to me and going like, Thank you. I haven't eaten so well in so many years. It's so great. Or they'll say, you know, my wife is very engaged on this. I'd like to give her a little something special. What can I buy that's special? Wow, we got these really cool cutting boards. Or, you know, like it, it has turned into this amazing business. So as a result of it, we now have some major sponsors involved with us. One of our major sponsors is Subaru Canada. Second sponsor is the Wobblueberry Association of North America. Third major sponsor is Country Magic Produce, which is the largest producers of, of fruits and vegetables in Atlantic Canada. Uh, another sponsor is uh, Liquid Gold, which is an olive oil company that we have all across Atlantic Canada. The list goes on. Lots and lots of great stuff happening with the Kilted Chef, but I want to hear about you guys. So that's sort of where we're at, Nora. What do you think? Thank you so much. That was so interesting. I think everybody would uh, would agree. I loved uh, I love your messages, and and I, I feel like we just got our own chef's office hour with you here. Um, yeah. But I loved how you talked about being authentic and and some of the things that happened when you were live. And I made a mistake with the record. That was me who hit the record by mistake. I apologize for that, but. I think that's so important to connect with people like, like that sort of proves that you really are live. You know, sometimes people wonder, is this really live? And I love that you talked about building something that, you know, you started and you kept having to look at new ways of doing things and adding things and your products and all those things. Um, uh, great messaging. Awesome. Uh, very timely. That's for sure. Uh, I'll open it to Q&A, but one did already pop up in the chat. Um, there was a question there about your team. How many people are on your team and what sort of roles do they do they play? Well, I'm gonna pose the question in reverse. How many members do you guys think we have on our team? You can unmute yourself now, by the way. Oh, somebody guessed four. Four. So we have on our team uh, regularly here, full-time is myself, my wife, Joanne, and my sous chef, Lisa. Lisa will come in only on special occasions when we do supper clubs or we do skills class or we do anything like that. Uh, and uh, we have at an arm's length, we have a marketing team of two uh, called Dashboard Living. Uh, great, great little, they're, they're influencers themselves. Uh, and they, tr they are travel influencers. So great people to have on your team. And that's about it. Everything else has just been done by ourselves. Well, that was the easiest question to answer. A small but mighty team. Anybody Excuse else me. have a have a question, uh, comment? You feel free to unmute yourself and 
and jump in. Sorry, that took me a while. Um, so what's next for you, Elaine? Uh, Brigade is, is playing a big role. There's no question now. Life is coming back to a little bit of normalcy. Uh, we are starting to travel again. We're in Montreal uh, in April. That's the first start of it. We have the biggest saltscape show as well that's coming up in April. Uh, that's the, you know, we have our regular roles, of, of course. It's, we're celebrating our 15th anniversary as the food editor of Saltscape magazine. Um, and uh, we are entering year four of CTV, What's for Dinner? Uh, and we have a French column as well on CBC. So all these things are happening in the background as well. So there's more to our business than just the show. Uh, we do all kinds of huge work with a lot of producers and processors developing recipes and so on and so forth. And not to mention we do, we have so far uh, 29 restaurants that we've made over, over the last 10 years of our business. So we're busy, we got a lot on the go. g -Miss keeps us busy as well. Can't wait to get back on the rock, sorry guys. I, I, such a wonderful place, such a wonderful place. And, uh, you know, I miss it. I haven't been there for, we actually snuck in one uh, full, uh, we did six live shows from Newfoundland, from, from, uh, from, from the whole area of, uh, of Gross Morn, of course. And uh, it was hugely successful uh, to have those live shows right there. It was kind of neat to show. And I, I'm really looking forward to see how many viewers of ours We'll brag about going to Newfoundland when uh, they go back to no restrictions. It'll be awesome. Yeah, and we've been in New Brunswick uh, a few times as well, uh, uh, doing some different shows. Uh, where uh, We have one of those dinner clubs with the Maple Association of New Brunswick coming up as well. If you're in New Brunswick and you're a maple syrup fan, there's lots going on, but lots on the go, lots on the go. But anything, like obviously this session intrigued you guys about something. Is there something in your business that you're doing that you have any questions about related to uh, how to or, or just how to go about? Feel free to unmute yourself if you, uh, if you wanna ask a question. You guys are way too polite. You're Atlantic Canadians. What's, what's wrong with you? <laughs> You're not okay, shocked. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in if nobody has questions. I always have questions. Um, so what mistakes have you made and learned from and you know you won't make again? <laughs> Letting them in too much. Uh, people, people have a sense of entitlement a little bit and we've noticed it more in the last month or so. Uh, like I'll give you an example. We did a major prize, uh, not a major prize. We do prizes all the time. And one of the prize was one of those curated boxes that we talk about. And, uh, so I shipped, uh, free, right? So one of our sponsors is Logan's Daily Catch. It's a seafood company. They sponsor a show every week and they've donated so many boxes as prizes during their show. One, one box per show. So we shipped the box to this lady, okay? This is what I mean by entitlement. Ship this box to this lady. The box got lost, okay? Somehow we also lost the tracking number. So nothing, you know, everything goes wrong when it goes wrong. Yeah. So we are totally out of those boxes. There's none. They're gone, right? Because we only make so many boxes. So being kind, we said, well, we're very sorry. We know this is Canada Post's problem and we know they lost it, but what can we do? We want to make sure you're happy. So we reshipped another box to her, okay? Well, it wasn't the same as what she was supposed to get. She wrote us a big long letter saying how ungrateful we were and how, you know, so on and so forth. I won't go into details, but the list goes on, right? And now she's no longer following us because of it. So you've got to have some pretty thick skin, I guess. And those are the things that if I was to do over again, 
Uh, I would be a little more direct about, there it is, take it or leave it sort of thing. Sometimes we try to overcompensate. We, we, we're from the mindset of being over, uh, we love to under promise and over deliver. And sometimes it doesn't always work. And those hurt, you know, little comments sometimes, uh, like we have one comment last, we did a note very right in the title, old fashioned, authentic carrot cake with cream cheese. It got something like 89,000 eyeballs to it. Very successful show, very, very well. One comment out of 787 comments said, I wish you did original recipes. Well, we really said at the top what we we're doing, but what happens when you're this close to the business and this close to the show is you take that right here, right? You take it right here and one comments ruin it for everything else because you dwell on that. It is on, it is on a Friday. So you're Tuesday before you get to talk to the audience again. And it, you, it just eats at you. So that part is probably the hardest part that there is. Uh, an, another little single one. Uh, Joanne is live on the show with me every day. She, we banter back and forth. Friday, we, we have fun with the audience. A lot of youngs feel comfortable to be able to say how they feel and so on and so forth. I get an email one day. This is about a year and a half in. And the lady says, well, I'm really considering becoming a follower of yours. I really, really love your show. I really love what you stand for. I love that you're promoting local all the time and so on and so forth. But the lady with the annoying voice, is she going to be there every show? <laughs> you know? And then you just say, oh, that's pretty hard for Joanne to take. So she had a bad weekend that weekend. You know what I mean? Like you, you need, I think the best advice for that is don't get too close to it because <laughs> it hurts sometimes. And now I'm only telling you the pretty ones. There's some pretty nasty ones as well. <laughs> Great advice. Great advice. I just have one quick question. Um, you talked a lot about your the, the other um, businesses and organizations that you work with. Have you found that in terms of like those that have come on board as sponsors, have you found that you tend to attract like-minded businesses sort of without even, because it sounds like a lot of the... Um, a lot of the, the companies that you talked about, you know, have similar mindsets. They're, they're about authenticity and local and that kind of thing. I just wonder, did that sort of happen, you know, um, kind of naturally? Or did you find you had to seek people out? Or how did that sort of play out? That's, a, that's an excellent question. You know what? Every single one of them has happened naturally. Uh, and the purpose behind it is we've had probably we've turned down at least four or five already of businesses that were only looking for our audience, nothing else. And that's not what this is about. And that's not what we're about. Um, we're very, uh, very, very strict on ourselves about that. It's not about the money. It's about the vision and about the brand itself. Like you would never see us promote something that we're not, um, big fans of so yeah so like for example uh liquid gold who's new on the show is new with us well one of the biggest reason is because we needed the product and we needed to promote a good quality olive oil we're always using something cheap synthetic oils that are available at the grocery store which we all know is not real olive oil right and uh, so we wanted to up our games and do something like that. The barbecue incident, we, we've now are entering our year three of sponsorship with this great little store called Warmth by Design. They have every single grilling barbecue section and they're masonerers at the same time. So they do fireplaces in the winter, they do barbecue in the summer and so on and so forth. It was a great fit. Uh, Subaru Canada, it's been a great fit great great fit uh we need they what they were trying to get to is introduce to people their new uh a, a car called ascent and what they're looking for is to show people that it can pull a trailer could pull a boat it's rugged it's but yet it's comfortable it's one and we were the perfect avenue for them to do that so that was a business decision more than a, 
financial decision. So it, you judge every single contract based on what you're looking for. Yeah. That's great. I am uh, mindful of the time. So I'll do a last call if anybody's got a final question or comment. Now's your, your opportunity to hop in. Just wanna say that uh, we're here. If there's anything, if you're, you're at a point you don't wanna ask questions live on this, uh, I know a lot of you are running some pretty interesting organizations of your own. We do an awful lot of consulting work all over the place as well to advise on anything related to food and beverage. So if, yes, this is a glamorous fun part that we do, but we also do all the grant work as well. So anytime you have questions or anything you need, don't be shy. You know, we're from New Brunswick. We live in Nova Scotia. We party and have fun in Newfoundland. And occasionally we'll peek over to the island just to have some fun as well. Maybe I could say thank you, Alain. Uh, with the COVID and the restriction, restriction lifted uh, in New Brunswick and we're moving on and moving forward with a new phase and with ending a big, a big phase of this pandemic, uh, I think uh, people will be starting to travel, uh, hoping to see you around in New Brunswick somewhere, uh, hoping to be the, uh, a, to be here in the peninsula as well. Uh, the events and the rural uh, and activities, festival and events starting back this year. So uh, maybe lots of things and new things moving forward. Well, I appreciate that, Yannick. The, uh, I am in Petit Rocher in uh, July. Uh, we sold out an event of the Blues Festival in Petit Rocher, believe it or not. So we're hey. turning the Petit Rocher key into a dinner for 200 people. It sold out in a week. Uh, I couldn't believe it. So the show, uh, to answer a quick question to Nora, we don't realize the effect that we've had by doing this show for the last two years. But that is one example of the effect. I mean, there's, if you do not know Petit Rocher, it's like saying, we're going to do uh, a dinner for 200 people on the Quay at Cow Bay, or in the middle of Surrey, New PEI, or uh, we're doing it in the smallest of community in New Brunswick that there is. We all know Petit Rocher is a small little village. Uh, and uh, we're talking less than, I don't know, less than a thousand or so in population. And all of a sudden, just like that, everybody's on the bandwagon and they want to do something different. So you just don't know what this little show of ours has created. And we're really looking forward to enjoy that ride into retirement, to be honest with you. It's, uh, it's been a 30 <coughs> few years. <laughs> and it's time to uh, not do as much as we used to and enjoy life. So, yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks, Nick. Thank you so much, everybody, and thank you so much for taking time this morning. Super interesting, uh, lots of great points, and uh, I think everybody who's listening and who will listen is going to get a lot out of this. So I really, really appreciate um, everything that you shared this morning. It's been wonderful.